Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 5th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, uh, I think you'll see I really mean it. We have uh, quite a bit to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. You know, it's kind of funny. I was watching a webinar the other day, and uh, the guy said, uh, Says, yeah, you know, before you do your webinars, you should do this. And, uh, you know, while you're off getting a Mountain Dew. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Is he, uh, is he copying my uh, secret for getting jacked up before the webinar? All right. Um, today's Week of Charts is brought to you by Financial Juice. www.financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry. Follow me there. It's a pretty cool website. It's a uh, social... Financial social media, it's probably the best way to describe it. It's pretty cool. Oh, good stuff. Okay, um, there's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for more than a day, as you know, you can lose money trading. Or, as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. This is a part of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon.com. And the reason I do that, as I say almost weekly, is because every night in you get a malignant person who likes to review the reviews. And, you know, lately I've been so darn busy, and probably for the last 10 years I've been so darn busy, I can't imagine that you would be, that you'd have enough time in your schedule to review the reviews. So, um, you know, read the book, and if you don't like the book, then. Say some, say what you don't like about the book. Somebody wrote that it takes too much time. It does take too much time. Um, but anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> no, it takes a, it does take a little time to do the analysis. But hey, you're competing against some of the brightest minds in the world, so you're gonna have to put your homework in. You think you're gonna be a surgeon and not have to do some work? Anyway, throw me a bone, put up a review on Amazon.com, and I will appreciate it. I'll give you a high five. Um, you know, once again, we seem to get hung up on this emerging trend thing, and I probably get more questions about emerging trends than all my other patterns combined. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of beat the dead horse on that yet again this week. Now, I got into an interesting Facebook conversation with someone on on a stock issue. This is um, one of my uh, Italian brethren over there in, um, in Italy, and he was um, he saw that I put some Pagani and Ferrari and Lamborghini pictures up on the website, and um, he's like, hey, I'm Italian, and I recognize those cars, so he started chit-chatting with me, and um, we got to talking about one of the stocks in the portfolio, and he had some questions about that, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, this is a question I get fairly often. Why do I track uh, closed positions in the open portfolio? That'll make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. Anything you want me to cover, let me know. I think we should be able to get most everything done uh, today and have enough time for some, some open-ended questions. And if we run out of time, we'll certainly uh, cover them next week. Uh, also, uh, hold off on any of your individual stock picks. For now, uh, but when we get to the charts and I open up for stock picks, uh, just put in one stock at a time and then hit carriage return. And then that way I can answer you on that one stock. If you put in 10 out of fairness to everyone else, I'll pick one and then uh, delete the question and then go to the next one. So if you don't mind, just put on one in the line. Or I'll try to, I won't delete it, I'll just, I'll try to get each one, but try to remember which one's. I did and didn't do a pretty much impossible. All right, I got an email. I'm a little concerned, not because all of your more recent positions are not in good shape, but more because the success of those positions are dependent on the bottom and a breakout of gold and oil from significant extended downtrends that many are predicting and anticipating. I feel these positions, therefore, are especially vulnerable. Well, you're probably right because, as I've been showing for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, especially in gold, are you saying R or is that the stock? Uh, hold off on stock picks for now, if, if you guys don't don't mind, because uh, people uh, 
or going to be asking questions. It, it'll push that questions off the screen. Uh, but as I've been saying for quite a bit, yeah, oil's in a longer-term downtrend. And there are still some people, and with some quite convincing arguments, that are predicting that oil is going to head lower. But this is what I saw a few weeks ago. Now, so far, what has it done? Well, it's kind of done a Janet Jackson. You know, what have you done for me lately? Not much. But what did I see? I saw a multi-year low. Okay. I saw a thrust off that low and a one-bar pullback. Well, to those of you who know my patterns, that's a first thrust. I talk about that often in these webinars, and you can go to my website and read about it. Now, in this particular case, because it wasn't like a first thrust like this, like in 2009 when the oil's bottomed out, it's almost like they rang a bell. Not that they ever ring a bell when the bottom's in place, but it was a little bit more obvious in 2009. And this time, maybe not so much, okay? It's, but it's still a pretty decent rally nonetheless. Now, you got to remember, this is a very inefficient, I'm sorry, efficient market. By the way, my article on efficiency should be out any day in Traders Magazine. I'll make an announcement on that um, soon, as soon as it does. So um, keep an eye on my website and my newsletter. And I think that's going to answer a lot of questions about trading efficient markets. But this is still a fairly significant move for something like oil off its lows. So I think it was worth a shot. Now, keep in mind that, again, it's not a big, huge up thrust like we saw in 2009 in a lot of these oil stocks and oil itself. But it's what I call a pioneer first thrust. Now, why do I call it a pioneer first thrust? Well... To those of you who don't know the pattern or know me, it's because you're a bit of a pioneer, okay? And like the American pioneers, one or two things are going to happen. You're either going to get the gold or you're going to get arrows in your back, okay? Now, keep in mind that these are emerging trend patterns. There are three phases of trend. You can have trend resumption, which is your generic pullbacks, TKOs and things like that. You can have trend acceleration is when you have this extended, accelerating trend, not necessarily extended, but accelerating trend. And then you could also have a pattern like a TKO in here. And then you could have an emerging trend. And I drew it like a cup and handle on purpose because a lot of times, especially if a market bottoms out nice and slowly, you have a cup and handle. Sometimes it's more of an event like this than a process. So these are emerging trend patterns. And again, your bid of a pioneer. This situation with oil and gold is unlike your previous picks, which were gems in a healthy and uptrending biotech sector, consistent, well, previous picks, keep in mind that I've been posting picks for over a decade, well, probably 15 years or more if you go way back to the TM days. Um, so there's a lot of stocks. You can't just look at the, the last few months. Consistent with its observation, why do you think they were, they were, there or there weren't there any picks at the civvies, which certainly turned around and now seem to be stable and trending up. Well, I didn't have time to to do a chart on the semis, so let's just let me see if I can make one on the fly here. Um, if I can do this, this uh, okay, here we go. So let's take a look at the semis. Let me just show you something there. Now, keep in mind, my methodology is not a be-all, end-all, and nor do I try to make it do that. I think it works well, and I don't try to... Um, I try to perfect it in that. I try to get better and better and better at reading charts, but I don't... Hey, margin call. I don't... Um, I don't try to make it the be-all, end-all, because there is no be-all, end-all. There is no perfect methodology. How many times do I have to tell you? I do a chart show at 11 Eastern every Thursday. And guess what? Next Thursday, unless, unless I get hit by a beer truck, I'll be doing a chart show. So if I could find the semis, life would get a lot easier. Talk amongst yourselves. 
You know what we could do? I'll just sort them by uh, company name. And again, I, I meant to have them set up. Now, so the question is, hey, they're trending. Why aren't we in some semis? Well, notice that recently you had some pretty big slides in here. So even if you did get long some, there's a good chance you may have gotten stopped out. The methodology requires a pullback. So on a breakout, you're not going to get setups, except on some rare occasions in something like an IPO where we do actually trade breakouts. But for the most part, we do not trade breakouts. I got an email this morning actually thanking me for the fact that he spent years trying to trade breakouts and, and frustration and asp aspiration, whatever. Exasperation? I think that's what I'm trying to say. He, he sort of gave up on that, but now he's, uh, he's, he's in tune with the trend following, and he gets it. He trades pullbacks. So, uh, Eric, if you're out there, thanks for that email. So until we get a pullback, we're not going to get set us again. Now, sometimes, and if you go in, let's just, let me just pull one out the air. CTLT, I think, would be a good one. Uh, sometimes you get a setup, and then even though the market's chopping around, you're able to stay with that setup. So we're long a couple of biotechs, but we didn't get the semis. Well, so what, okay? We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to go after them soon. I have a ton of semis on my watch list and my momentum list. And we're going to go after them as soon as we see setups. So we let the setups from the date, we let the database tell us what to do via setups. So that's why we don't have any portfolio. Do I wish we had some civvies in the portfolio? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Do I have civvies in my momentum list, such as a Landry 100? Well, as we say in Fargo, you betcha. Okay? Let's just take a look at that because we have plenty of. I hope we have plenty of time today. You know me. I start uh, rambling off on like Chief Orman, and before you know it, we've wasted some time. Um, where's the Landry 100? Uh, let's see. Just out of curiosity, is there a way to do this? And there's probably a few more that I haven't put in. Um, let's see if I could do this. I wish I knew. It's like I think of these. Oh, here we go. Okay, now there's probably more in here. Yeah, look at that. Semi, 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 semi. So I got plenty of them on my list. But if you look at a lot of these, there's really no setup in there. Well, but Dave, why are they on your list? Well, this is my momentum list, okay? This is tracked a little bit differently. This is a, I hate to use the word mechanical because, you know, I, I actually uh, use discretion in putting things in it, but I actually use, and then this, this is a couple more semis that go in, that need to go in the portfolio now from last night. I actually uh, use a little discretion in putting them in, but the only rules that I have is that they make a new high, and that forces me to keep an eye out on a sector. So uh, I can't guarantee we'll be in every sector, okay? But when I see something like oil coming off a low like this and recently uh, gold, then, um, then I take it. Now the gold didn't work out, okay? So what? Um, we get paid to put money in harm's way. If you capture one stock coming off the lows, and it goes up 200, 2%, hopefully more than 200%, 2%. It goes up 200%, 300%, 400%, or 500 or 600% like little solar stocks did a couple of years back. Then you've paid for a lot of stabs at a market. So what do you get in here? Let's just assume this is a stock and not the overall um, crude oil. If it comes down and stops you out, so what? Okay, you're risking this much. You have the potential, even if it's crude oil, I think it's crude oil could easily double. So you have the pitch to make that much. Okay? Is it working yet? No. But it's worth a shot. Okay? Still only financial juice showing. Uh, no, it should be um, your, your screen is stuck. So log out and then log back in. I don't think that's what you're doing. Somebody asked a question about sand while we're on it. Yeah, sand's the one that failed miserably. But yesterday, let's look at what it did. We had a stop at 315. We'll take a look at the portfolio one second. But we had a stop at 315. So where did it go? It went to 314. So it nicked that stop by a penny. 
what do you do? Well, if you don't have any discipline, you have a hard stop head, you get stopped out, you drop an F-bomb, and you get on with your life. If you do have a little discipline, and just only takes a little bit, then set an alarm that'll go off. Maybe you get a little buzz on your smartphone or whatever. That'll tell you, hey, the stock is getting close to the stop. You might have to take a little action. So take a peek at the chart. And if it just hits the stop or hits the stop by a penny or two or even a little bit more than that, give it a little bit of wiggle room around a stop, it turns right back around and stick with it, okay? Now, I don't want to turn this into a lesson of discretion because we've done that a thousand times. And if we keep getting bogged down, we'll never, we'll never get ahead and learn anything new. Um, so watch the uh, plenty of YouTubes out there our discretion in this stuff. So t take a look for uh, other weeks in charts. And then I'll start, um, somebody complained because there is no index. I'll start trying to index these things a little bit better uh, from now on. It's probably too much of a major undertaking at this point because I've got so much content out there. But it's okay to stick with a position if it nicks the stop. Now keep in mind, there's always trade-offs. Uh, tomorrow could gap lower and you could be in a whole lot of trouble, but it's worth it longer term to apply a little discretion to possibly stay with these positions. Okay. Now, one thing about one thing about having this educational business that I love, actually, I actually hate it. One thing I hate about it is that I get raked over coals. But one thing I sort of love is that I get raked over the coals. Well, D, what? How can you love it and hate it? Well. I hate it because it's a pain in the ass, <laughs> having to justify everything, being put into the microscope. But the beauty of it is, and it's like I get a little philosophical every now and then when I start, especially, you know, I've learned over the years, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, okay? I've learned over the years, instead of getting aggravated and let that aggravation manifest, I kind of take a what's good about this situation. The fact that I get emails from people questioning the positions tells me, well, either they don't get the methodology or, or maybe the, the maybe I should be questioned on that. So it forces me to look at things, to justify things, to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Now the thought I was having right literally as before I right before I got started this webinar was that it, it holds me accountable. And it, it, it's kind of like, uh, what was it, what was it uh, you know, Jerry Maguire, you make me want to be a better person or something like that, or one of those movies, uh, as good as it gets or something. Um, well, you do complete me, but, you know, I guess it's sort of, you make me want to be a better person. And it forces me, again, to, to, to do the right thing and make sure I'm picking the best of the best and make sure that I really do have an opportunity. And that's why if you're... If you've been around me for a while, you know I'll go extended times and not even recommend anything, little or nothing, okay? A lot of people quit because they're looking for action. I can make a lot more money if I just threw a bunch of crap out there. In fact, um, many years ago, uh, back in the trading markets day, when they actually trading markets days, back when they had salesmen, when I would stop recommending stocks because it wasn't to, uh, anything to do, we would lose clients. And the salesman would call me up and, and say, Dave, you, you've got to start recommending something. We're losing clients. And initially, I felt a little pressure on that before we reached this point. And I found that I could recommend stocks and they could fail miserably. And we won't lose clients or won't lose many. Or I could, if there's nothing to do, not recommend anything and in turn not lose anybody but we lose clients. So I realize that people are craving action. So in that particular case, I know I have to do the right thing. So anytime I put a setup on, it's it's well thought. And boy, I'm rambling here, but, but I know that at least at the time, without perfect hindsight, that I know that, or at least I want to feel that I can come back a week from now, a month from now, two months from now, and honestly say that, you know what, given that same exact situation, without any benefit of, hides, benefit of hindsight, I would do the same exact thing once again. Now, when I go back and review these archives going back years and years and years and years and years, 
every now and then I'll find myself thinking, what the hell was I thinking? But the good thing is, over the past few years, I've found myself doing that less and less and less and less. So as long as you're true to yourself and you feel like you really have a good setup, whether it works or not is inconsequential on an individual basis. Obviously, longer term, you need some of these setups to work. Otherwise, why would you be doing this? Now, it's kind of a long-winded way. I've kind of went all the way, skirted all around the issue that I wanted to get to. The issue I wanted to get to is I have a lot of wealthy people that are on the service, and they're very successful businessmen, and they've made a lot of money in their business, and trading is sort of their side venture or their new venture, depending on how you want to look at it. And quite a few of these guys, they lose twenty-five grand here and there, and they just kind of sweep it under the rug, and no one really knows about it, okay? They're making millions of dollars, sometimes literally millions of dollars, on some of these other business ventures. So what's twenty-five k or 50 k or maybe even 100 k in some rare cases on the side? It just kind of gets swept under the rug. Well, if their wife or spouse or significant other, however you want to look at it, most are men, so I, I guess that's why I said wife, but there, there are some successful uh, ladies out there that are on the service too, um, and hats off to you. Um, if, but let's say their spouses are looking at their trades, then they'd be like, well, why did you, what's going on here? Why did you lose $25,000 or what? What happened this hundred grand? That's that's still a lot of money. We know you're big and successful, but I think it would be harder for them to run out and do a whole bunch of day trades, run out and buy a bunch of penny stocks or whatever they're doing to lose that capital if they're held accountable. So the point I'm getting at is I'm held accountable. Now it's a pain in the ass, <laughs> truth be told, but it forces me to make sure that I'm doing the right thing, and it makes me make sure that with with 100% confidence, I feel that something is going to work. Will it work? No, not all the time, but longer term and enough to make it all worthwhile for me personally and for you. So hold yourself accountable in your action or find somebody that's willing to hold yourself accountable. Now, be warned, it's not uh, uh, an easy thing, okay? But as long as you could justify what you're doing, you shouldn't have to worry too much about that, okay? Okay. Um, so I think that's the transitional thing. Made the mistake of exiting sand. Can you address the money management here? Yeah, well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't call it a mistake for exiting uh, because the stop truly did get hit, okay? So if you're following it mechanically because it hit 314, dropped below 315, right? It got hit. But so far, it just kind of nicked that stop. And in this particular case, I think you could stay with it, okay? Now, let's get back to the slides. As usual, I digress. So I think we covered that. All right. So I've got a little Italian friend over here and uh, on Facebook. And like I said, he saw he saw me doing some posts. Went to uh, the Ferrari Museum. I've been to the factory before, which is just, um, it's not like you get to go on the floor like they do at Ducati. So it wasn't that great. Uh, so I had no inclination to go there. But I did go to the Ferrari Museum, which, it's definitely worth a visit if you're into cars. Um, went to Lamborghini Museum, which is at the factory, but they don't let you in the factory. And uh, Pagani, which you actually let you in the factory. Um, anyway, so I went to all these places, and, and my little Italian friend um, uh, starts to chat with me, and he I gave him a look at uh, gave him a peek at the uh, current portfolio, and he says, "Ruby, is it a great investment?" So my point is, we're up thirty percent. In three months, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. But if every trade did that well, I'd be the richest guy on earth, okay? And he's like, uh, excuse me, uh, I see the last day, okay? Well, my point is, like, 
don't focus on one day's action. Focus on whether or not you're stopped out. Okay. So he understands, but he's um, he sees a great force, and the point is that it's a doji, and it equals a lot of uncertainty in his candlestick analysis. Of course, what's my answer? I don't use candles. Okay. <laughs> Any samples? No. At the Cotty, though, the guy asked, uh, when, when, when can we have a test drive? That was kind of funny. On my bucket list, I do want to go over there and, and drive some of the cars, but um, I think there's some complications in that, so I need to get um, – my host is not – uh, he's not in the car, so was not in the car, so he's not intimately familiar with it. But I don't want to go. I don't want to go over there and kill myself, um, you know, not knowing what I'm doing, and then um, my family will have to pay for a three hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini in the process. So, um, but I, I I will eventually. Just we were just so busy last trip. Uh, I, I just want to know the uh, the parties I'm dealing with because I, I hear you got to be very careful over there, and I was warned explicitly on like one of my first visits, you know, don't go over there and, and rent a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or whatever because you'll get in a lot of trouble. Um, anyway, I digress. Okay, his point was that, oh, it's a doji, okay? And a doji, well, I shouldn't even say because I don't want to get, um, show you how little I know about candles. Actually, I studied candles quite extensively a while back, and I decided they're not for me. A doji is where a market opens, where it closes. It suggests a lot of indecision. So he was thinking that this is very bearish. That's a bad investment. Well, the stock rallied about 4% since then, and it actually made an outside day up. This is very bullish as far as I'm concerned. Well, I hate to use the word very because it's just one day, but it's an outside day up. Well, let's, let's use the old terminology on the candle people. Well, guess what else? It's an engulfing pattern, okay? Is that a positive thing, or it, it's what's a fat wrestler with three little babies following him or something, or, or a big duck with three little ducks pooping on a wire? You know, the point is, I make a lot of fun of all that stuff, but this is not that big of a deal. It's just one day, okay? So don't get too caught up in that. Now, again, this was a dead money example from uh, recently, last week, I think. So it went up about 30%, and that's 140% annualized. So if you make 140% on every trade annualized or even 30% shorter term, you're going you're gonna to own the world pretty quick. The uh, money will grow geometrically, and it, pretty soon you'll own the entire market. So uh, that's a very uh, respectable gain, okay? And as you see me show before, Let's say you get in a position here, okay, and let's say you're up 50% here, you're up 40% uh, here, then you're up 75% uh, here, then you're up, I guess, even 50% here, let's say 100, and then 75, and so on and so on. Mountain Dew's kicking my butt. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is that if you quit at 50 you never get to 75, and you quit at 75, you'll never get to 100. You quit at 100, you never get to 200, so on and so forth. So you will take a little heat on your trades, but we have a trailing stop in place, and that's going to take care of that. Don says, just go rent a Ford. I'm sure you could drive that car. I actually sit in the girl's seat. We did rent a little, um, we rented a little Fiat a couple years ago, and we drove through uh, Tuscany, then we drove drove up, drove up to uh, Genoa. And all. My, but I sit in the girl's seat. My wife actually did the drive it. She looked down and saw a, a stick shift, and I think um, in her head, she immediately had an oh shit moment, and then uh, and then she looked up at me and smiled, jammed it in the first gear, and oh, jammed in reverse, actually, uh, popped the clutch and took off. I think she stalled out once in about four days, and uh, so she's, she's actually, I hate to admit this, she's actually a better driver than I am, so well, not many guys will admit that. Okay, um, any questions on uh, a candle pattern or a one-bar pattern or whatever, you got to look at the big picture. And if you could squint your eyes and look at the chart and you really can't see that little action that happened today or yesterday or the day before or earlier this morning, then 
that you probably shouldn't worry about it too much, okay? Obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. The trades will take care of themselves. Whether or not you're stressed out or not, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. And it doesn't matter how much you worry about it, how much you think about it, how much you justify it, how much news you watch. It's going to do what it's going to do. If you go into a trade with good conscience and say, this looks like a good setup. I like this setup. It looks good. All these pieces are fitting, or at least enough pieces fit to make it worth trading. Then take the trade and plan the trade. Well, plan the trade first, okay? And then trade the plan. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out, okay? If there's a doji or a man hanging from a wire with a baby and whatever, if you're stopped out, then you stopped out. But if all these things happen and you don't get stopped out, then you stay with the position. I know it's a lot easier said than done. And I preach this often, and I was guilty earlier this week. I forget which day, but uh, there was one day where everything was kind of crappy. Came in, turned on my screens, everything was kind of crappy. Dropped an F-bomb, went for a walk, took a little bike ride, got nice and sweaty, came back to my office, and uh, everything was back up. So I wasted all that energy for nothing, okay? No positions were nowhere near the stop. Well, maybe Sam was kind of close. But other than that, it's like, why did I waste that energy? So just let things let things play out. And your life will get a lot easier. Okay, I get a lot of questions on on why I keep the open part of the portfolio. As you know, when we take a position, okay, I like to see that as two loaves. One half is a trading loaf, okay, and one half is a trending loaf. And if you've seen my presentation or seminars, webinars, seminars, whatever, where I talk about the little stick man with the hat that's a trader and little stick man with the hat that's a trend follower. A longer term trend follower is going to make the most money, but they're also going to lose the most over a short period of times. And that could be a little scary and in some cases could actually cause you to blow up, as I've said quite a bit. We all read about these famous trend followers, and except for those who quit at the right time, many of them have uh, have blown up. And not to take anything away from them. I mean, we all get our butt handed to us in this business sooner or later, or quite often, I should say. But it, it exemplifies the risk involved with longer-term trend following, but that's where the money is. So what's a trader to do? Well, trade for a short-term gain and then lighten up on that position. And ride out that longer-term trend with a smaller position and put a little money in your account. So that also kind of solves your need to be right soon, and it also solves the ego's need to be right big. So if done properly and things work out, you're right soon, and you get an instant gratification. We live in this microwave society where we have everything instant. Like I've said before, you can't even... There's no more movie stores anymore. I think there's one that I know of within 50 miles of where I live. And it's the last one. It's the last of the Mohicans. It's probably a front for something. It's probably a, probably a good place to go buy some uh, crack cocaine. Uh, but anyway, why? Well, because I can't drive to a movie store. I was, oh, that's too much hassle. I can't wait that long. I, I need to instantly download me a movie. Okay. Uh, I, I microwave. I, I, I got to wait in that microwave. I, gotta, I want my food right away. We can't wait on anything anymore. We're not. We're not patient. So that's a society we have become. Well, the market doesn't care about that. The market moves on its own time frame. But I think if you could take a short-term profit, sometimes you're fortunate enough to where you get that short-term profit, and it kind of it 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 fills that need, that instant gratification need that we all have. But we all still have longer term bigger egos, okay? So the longer term trade sort of solves that problem too. And it also solves the problem of making good enough money trading. That's where the real money is, okay? Um, I get emails quite often, David can't make any money with this. 
you know, I don't get it. And and as I've said a thousand times, it's like, did you get this one big trade? No. Did you get this one big trade? No. And but you got the dozen other stinkers. Well, those one or two big trades could make your year, and that's very important. It's very crucial. And that's the that's the tough part of this method of my methodology, is chipping away at it, chipping away at it, chipping away at it. And finally, you hit a couple out of the park. Most people give up. They go off to chase rainbows, and then. Sometimes I'm lucky enough to come back 10 years later and say, Dave, I get it. There's no holy grail. We just got to chip away at it. Anyway, the point is there's a trading loaf and a trending loaf, half and half, okay? So let's assume right here we got 333 and 333. Let's just use round numbers. Let's just say 600 is what I determined to be the position size in this. So 300 of those are going to be for my – Trading loaf, my swing trade, and 300 are going to be from a longer-term trade. So if done properly, I'll usually make about $1,000 on the first loaf. You can see right here, 1000 bucks. Every now and then we get lucky and it gaps through it. In this particular case, it was $1,300 and change. Okay? So you're looking for, you're looking to make, risking 2% if stopped out, you're looking to make 1% on the trade. But, Dave, that's not enough. You're, you're making half as much as you're risking. Well, settle down, Beavis. As somebody pointed out recently, if, if you're Beavis, then what am I? Uh, good point. Anyway, so you're only making half as much, but that's okay because on the second loaf, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully the second loaf will run for a much, 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 much bigger profit, okay? Now, why do I leave a in? Well, I'm trying to show the complete trade because sometimes what happens is you'll make a 1,000 on the first loaf and you'll scratch out on the second. Well, that's still a successful trade. Okay, now you didn't set the world on fire, but you made a thousand bucks on a hundred k account. Okay, better than poking the eye. Okay, so that'll help keep the lights on, and that'll pay for some commissions. That'll pay for your quote feed if you're uh, if you're paying for one. Okay, and it'll help keep you in the business. Now you don't want a whole lot of losses that only make a thousand, and that's why we have the second part of the trade that is open-ended, okay? Now, in this particular portfolio, you got roughly $3,000, and you only have $6,000 of open profits total. So so this does sort of inflate this a little bit. I think that's the problem that many people are having is that it inflates it. Well, again, I think it's more important to show the whole trade except instead of having, like, you know, then it would be asking, I mean, uh, fielding questions, well, Dave, how come you have two of this stock and just one of this stock and, this position looks pretty small compared to this position. Uh, here, you got these two positions. So it's like, no, let's just keep it simple. And when the entire trade closes out, we'll take the entire trade out all at once and move it on. To each his own. You could do whatever you want. Now, I want to point out one more thing, too. I shouldn't even say this, but uh, I'm on a roll. <laughs> it's like I used to not even publish the open portfolio in the service. Because I was concerned that uh, people would, uh, you know, it, it's, it, I guess it kind of skirts a lot of, of, of educational, uh, the, the, the true meaning is educational purposes only. And, and when you start showing open portfolios, any kind of, I, I thought it was kind of a gray area. But the more I thought about it, it's like, well, it provides a wonderful teaching example, just like I'm doing right now, uh, on the money management, the importance of stops, the importance of letting letting profits ride. So that's why I started putting the open portfolio in there. But it's like if I get too many complaints, it's kind of like it was a back where when I was a kid, uh, actually long before I was a kid, it's a story I heard. There was a a gentleman that owned a shrimp boat, and uh, he put a toilet on a shrimp boat, and it was the only strip, shrimp boat in town that had a toilet on it. And everybody was all, the workers were all excited. They got a toilet on their boat. Yay. So they go out for two days, and they come back in. They're supposed to stay out for a week. <laughs> and the captain, or the owner, I should say, was like, why would you come back in? I said, well, the toilet broke. And <laughs> captain got a couple of wrenches, went down in the boat, and, and starts working on the toilet. And I guess the crew was thinking, all right, it's going to fix our toilet, you know. <laughs> so the captain unbolted the toilet, walked to the back of the boat, threw the toilet overboard, <laughs> and said, uh, all right, go back out. <laughs> so... Anyway, I'm not going to get rid of the portfolio, but it does kind of remind me of that story. And that's why I leave them in. And, you know, take out, add them up and take them out of this if you want. 
it's not like I'm hiding anything. It's all here, okay? But I do want to show, I do think it's important, again, not to beat the dead horse, but it's important to show that, hey, if we make a 1,000 on the first, it's zero on the second. We add this up, we still make a 1,000 bucks, okay? Now, any questions on that? Bullish and golfing, only bearish. Bullish and golfing, only bullish at trend bottom. Look for sell signals on been golfing at top, the top. Well, Howard, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not a candle guy. And if you're, and I have friends that are candle guys. Uh, my friend Greg Morris actually went to. He was one of the first. Uh, this had got all the credit. For some reason, I don't know why, but uh, I think Greg was one of the first persons. He actually went to Japan and studied candles, so uh, and he's a good friend of mine. So I'm not, but he and I agree. It's like a lot of times people are like, well, it's reversing the trend. Well, sometimes there's no trend to reverse, and then some of the patterns simply don't work. And Greg has actually done research to prove that some of them actually don't work. So. Um, I'm not going to say we agree to disagree because I think we kind of agree. I think it's the it's the way people approach candles. It's like somebody saying stochastics are bad or stochastics are good. Well, I don't use stochastics, so I'm not a big fan, but it depends on how you use them. So candles aren't necessarily bad. It depends on how you're using them. And if you're making each little bar mean something that's not there, okay, then, then you might have a problem with them. And even if you look at some of these candle books, and I'm not going to mention anybody's name, but they'll show you a pattern. It's like, oh, look, big reversal here. It's like, well, wait a minute. That pattern showed up 15 times previous in this chart, and there was no reversal, okay? To each his own, though, okay? It's not my way or the highway. Okay, uh, no trend, no signal. Price is double one. Yeah, okay, well, that's, yeah, I agree. Uh, the, um, yeah, and that's the thing, too. Like, I know some people out there that are using these arcane methods, and the ones that are that seem to be more successful doing it are the ones that are doing it within the trend, and that sort of makes their framework, okay, just like I use classical technical analysis. I use a lot of it. But I don't rush out and trade it. I don't say, oh, I've got a double top, I'm going to trade it. I've got a double bottom, I'm going to trade it. Got a head and shoulders, I'm going to trade it. No, it's like, okay, well, i got a head and shoulders bottom. Like somebody pointed out, I think it was Phil, pointed out in uh, one of these markets recently. And did I trade it? No. But when it made a bow tie, a first thrust, I forget whatever it was, then, yeah, I'm like, okay, i got a head and shoulders within a bow tie. I'm going to take it, okay? So the people that I find are successful with indicators or arcane methods or whatever, candles, are taking the signals within the context of the trend, and they're trading with the trend, okay? Well, for me, why not just boil it all down and let's just trade the trend, okay? Take off those layers of complexity. And trust me, I put all those layers of complexity on many, many years ago, and it took me years to take them all off, okay? Uh, random thought here. I was looking at this right before, the, it's like right before the show, I get all jazzed up and start looking at all these different things, and uh, I ended up running out of time to uh, get my slides done. But one thing that I wanted to point out is that the bull market in IPOs is not dead yet. And in 2013, I did the stock selection webinar, and there was one little IPO pattern that I showed in there that I was pretty excited about because I had recognized that there was a bull market in IPOs in 2013, late 2013. And I kept thinking that I'm going to do something with IPOs, and I wasn't sure in what way, shape, or form. And then I got to thinking, maybe I'll do a webinar, or a course, I should say, for starters. And I kept thinking, you know, this dang bull market is going to end, and I'm going to look like an idiot with egg on my face. So finally, months and months later, I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it because so far it's continued on, and I use the tree analogy. Okay, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and then the second best time is today. So if I import this knowledge and the bull market ends, maybe next year we'll have a new market, or maybe five years from now we'll have a new bull market, and you'll be able to succeed with these patterns. So that's why I did the IPO webinar. 
And, of course, like right after I did it, uh, there was a few shots across the bow, and, and all of a sudden the IPO market kind of came in quite a bit, corrected a little bit. But since then, in over the last uh, six, eight months or so, it's not maybe maybe not as great as it was in early in late 2013 and early 2014, but for the most part, the bull market continues at IPOs. Now, it's not a bull market like 1999 where you throw a dart and they all go up and we all just uh, kiss each other, high five, and count our money. It's a bull market where two things happen. As I said before and in the webinar, usually. They either die, they come public and do this, and there are certain characteristics that help them to do that, but uh, we won't get into that today, or they fly, okay? And a lot of times, they do both. They do what I call the fly and the die, and that's why money management is very important. So I was looking at some earlier, and quite a few of them ran up and have stopped out, but the fly could be very significant. So you trail that stop higher. You're hoping that it flies. It keeps on flying. But a lot of times reality sets in. In this case, it's a, a reality that the company may not ever be anything. And that's why I, I named the, the course the promise of the future, okay? Well, you could make a lot of money on the promise, okay? In fact, you're going to make more money on promise in markets than you will on reality as a general statement. I mean, every now and then you'll catch a stock that goes up forever, okay, that does great, that has reality too. But for the most part, as a trader, short to intermediate term, you're going to make a lot more money off the excitement of a market. And the example I used when I was just um, in Italy a couple weeks back speaking is that uh, one of the stocks I looked up, in fact, I think this went into my article in Traders Magazine on efficiency. And my point was that the less quantifiable fundamentals that you have, the more inefficient the market is. And I showed one of these little um, IPOs that we traded in here recently. And I went back and looked at the earnings uh, for uh, academic purposes only. And that particular stock, I think, lost $2.91. So they lost $3.00 last year, over the last 12 months or whatever the, the earnings reporting period is. So here's an IPO. We're up 100% in whatever the case may be. I forget. Uh, it might be CTLT, but we're not. But whatever it is, we're, we were up significantly at this IPO on one of the recent ones. Anyway, but if you go back in, I've got the slides. I can find them if you're interested. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the exact trades and all and when they triggered and blah, blah, blah. Just shoot me an email. But my point was that the stock lost three dollars so it's so they're losing money why would you buy them well it's the promise of the future so a lot of times you could make a lot of money on that promise in this particular case maybe the stock that lost three dollars let's say those three dollars last year but they're up a hundred percent okay maybe somewhere over here some analyst comes out and people get wise and say well this company will never be anything that dies out so what we're traders. You get stopped out. You get stopped out. You make, uh, let's say, you make 75% of the trade. Well, shoot, you know, you do that in every trade. You own the world even quicker. <clears throat> can a long-term system can can a long-term system can work for making a living? By the end of each month, you need to cover your credit card billings. Um. Well. You, you have to look at, at at capital gains versus income, okay? Um, I forget whether it was early in, I think it was early in 2014. We had like 10 trades in a row. Unfortunately, they all stopped out, or most of them stopped out as a scratch. So we only made a tiny little bit on those trades. So over that small period of time, it looked like the income-producing system. Hey, Dave, this is great. We were right on... 90% or 100% of these trades, we got 10 trades in a row, they all made money. Well, I didn't consider that a failure. As long as the, the bottom line is getting bigger, I'm okay. But I consider a failure in that we didn't catch any longer-term big trends. So that's where the real money is. So you catch that, that trade, that's going to have your account go up 30% over a year's time, and then you take out, you take some money off of that account. 
and you use it to cover, as you pointed out, your credit card bills, okay? Um, but you have to have enough and be realistic enough and then, you know, longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. You might have that 100% year, but in between, you might have a flat year. 2014 was not a good year, okay, for a trend follower. And I've talked about this a thousand times. You get long, and then all of a sudden, the whole market corrects 10, 11, 12%. Well, the buy and hold guys just sit on their hands, okay? But, and they ride it out. So it rewarded bad behavior, rewarded those buy and hold people. But the reality is you should have exited your position and got out of the way because in 2007, the market began to roll over. What did we do? We not only got out of the way, we began shorting the market, okay? And the buy and hold people and the average fund manager lost half of their money because they just didn't bother getting out of the way. They followed it down, not by shorting it, by just holding on their positions and living at home, okay? So just be prepared for some long, flat times if you're trend following. But when trend following works, it can be a very beautiful thing. And it's the patience while waiting for it to work. So I would suggest that you not put too much pressure on yourself. If you're happy in your current or prior career, then continue to, to do that. I shouldn't say prior career. If you're your current career, I guess. They continue to do that, and you can still trade, and you don't have to spend all day looking at a screen, okay? I keep myself very busy with projects and running my educational business and consulting and doing all these little other things. I, there, I can't – I'm just – I'm swamped. I wake up at – you know, my daughter asked me this morning, how do you wake up at 5.30 every morning and you're so happy? And it's like, well, because I have to be happy because I know I have to – a ton of things ahead of me that I have to do. But I keep myself so busy to where it's almost like, okay, if I can put on a trade, I know that that's going to take time away from everything else. So I've got to really like that trade. And that's why I always say busy traders make good traders, okay? Now, you, have to, you can't watch that screen all day. It's not going to take that much time, obviously, to put the trade on. But I'm just saying that I try to keep myself busy enough so I'm not firing off these trades all day long out of boredom. Trust me, I've been there, I've done that, I've got a t-shirt, okay? All right, um, just FYI, uh, if I don't say anything, somebody's going to complain. If I say something, it's like, why are you selling stuff? Well, somebody's got to pay for all this, right? <laughs> I spend thousands of dollars on a webinar software and everything, so this uh, obviously helps to recoup things. Uh, stock selection webinar, or course, I should say, it's about 14 hours. Uh, if right now, if you get it, if you buy it, you get a whole year of my service. So my theory, my think, my thing is, I always like to do this. I like to do things in theory, and then I like to do things in practice. I like to teach stuff, and then I like to show you in real time. And this is why we use so many real examples each week in these webinars. But in the stock selection course, what I did was went out, showed you how to pick stocks, and then I said, okay, let's pick some stocks. So we picked the stocks, and then. Uh, knock on wood, we had some phenomenal returns based on the stocks that I picked. And if you look at this, the, uh, the page, the spreadsheet is there. And then I think that it, it's kind of a nice way of dovetailing in with the, with the theory is that, okay, well, you get to see a whole year of me picking stocks, and then you could pick your own and compare your picks tomorrow. So that's why I threw in a year of the service. Uh, but I'm going to decouple those things just to – for a variety of reasons, but I'll do a couple of those things uh, tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, uh, get it today, and then uh, that'll be it. Okay, if you get a chance, check out my store, DaveLander.com. Okay, and then uh, I'm not going to bore you with all this other stuff, but just to, as I mentioned the IPO course earlier, uh, anything I do, unlimited lifetime support. Now, don't email me. I mean, you could. I wouldn't get too mad, but if you want to learn, don't email me and say, what do you think about XYZ? I want you to say, Dave, I'm looking at XYZ. It's a buy and B pattern. I'm thinking about getting in here. I'm thinking about stop here. What do you think about that? Then I'll be happy to answer you, even though it might take a little bit longer, because it's a little, it'll take me a little longer other than a thumbs up or thumbs down. But otherwise, you won't learn. 
But yeah, unlimited lifetime support. It doesn't mean, hey, I'm working on a trading system. Can you help? No, that's not what that is. It just means that, hey, if there's an IPO that you're looking at and you need some help, then I'll be happy to do so. The less I pay attention, the better I do. Otherwise, my feelings take over, says Matt. Yeah, Matt, I like that. I like that point. You know, my point I made uh, years ago was um, I went on a sailboat trip in the West Indies. We rented a big boat. We had a bunch of us together, uh, three or four couples. And we rented a huge boat, and we sailed around the West Indies, and we had a really good time. And I had some positions on before I left. And back then, we had a sat phone, but it was problematic at best, and um, it just was kind of a pain in the butt. So, obviously, I was uh, kind of on my own. Well, first thing I did when I got to the airport was I grabbed an, an IBD, looked at the positions, and I realized that I'd made a fortune while I was gone. And so, as soon as I got back to my office, I was so excited I sold everything. And I pocketed the money, and I felt like a genius. And I was, I was just getting started uh, as a full-time trader at the time. Uh, it was 94, 93, 92, somewhere in there, maybe 94. Uh, and I thought I was pretty smart. And then I, if, then I realized, had I stayed on vacation, I'd have probably made five to maybe even ten times the amount that I made. So it made me realize that just because I'm watching the screen doesn't mean I'm going to be more profitable. And then initially I found that when I was full-time at this, when I first went full-time, I actually did worse initially because I was too busy watching the screen and too busy firing off day trades and doing things that I wasn't supposed to do. Okay. Are you going to upload this to YouTube? Yes, I think so. As long as you guys continue to appreciate them, I'll keep uh, uploading them. All right, let's, uh, let's get to the charts. Uh, you guys should start asking about individual stocks now. Ideally, Don, we want to make sure that the stock is uh, trending in a pattern, trending or emerging trend in a pattern that I, um, that's one of my patterns, okay? Now, before we do that, let me just uh, hop in. Let me show you the market real quick, and we'll get into some um, stuff there. Let's take a look at the overall market. Let's take a look at the couple sectors in here, and then we'll hop out into the charts. Uh, S&P 500, so far so good. I'm a little disappointed that it did not break out and not look back. In an ideal world, this is what I want to see coming out of a base. I'd like to see it break out, not look back for a while, and then have some orderly corrections along the way. Okay, but you can't always get what you want, as you know, in markets. And so far, it broke out, but then it came all the way back into the top of the base. The good news is, yesterday it found support on the top of the base, bounced off of it, and managed to close. I'm not going to say close well, but it closed off its worst levels. And today we're up a little bit. Let's not focus on the micro too much, but just know that as long as we stay above, let's just say 2075 round numbers. The market is okay. Does it mean that let's flip a switch and, would, and you just rush out and, and, and buy, 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 but it means the market's okay. If it gets back in the rage and we're back in the rage and we're back to drawing these stupid sideways arrows. But so far, so good. We've broken out and we just come back to kind of kiss the range. Sometimes the market will do that. Now, the NASDAQ looks really good. The importance of what's going on in the NASDAQ is we have a – a nice persistent move, and I have the linear regression drawn in for you, but persistency mathematically equivalent uh, to linear regression. So you just draw a trend line through as many bars as possible. And notice how many bars we have that are actually above the, the, uh, the trend line drawn through the bar. So let's do a linear regression, and let's see what it happens by doing that line. So you can see that if we cover roughly the same period with a linear regression line, um, it looks pretty much the same. So I just like to draw a line through the bars, but persistency is a very powerful concept. And the more, I mean, that's one advantage that I, that I have. And, and the more I teach, the more I learn. And, and anybody who, ever, who has ever taught anything will uh, attest to that. So, but the more I teach, the more I look at these persistent markets, and the more I realize how important that concept is. That means that 
there's buyers coming in day after day after day after day after day. So, so far, so good in NASDAQ. I almost would have preferred if we'd have had, as I wrote the column a couple of days ago, more of a knockout move and then have it, bam, go straight back up. But I'm not going to complain. It's going up again, and we're not too far from all, from uh, not all time highs, but from 15 year highs on the NASDAQ. So, so far, so good there. Most sectors are looking pretty good in here. The energies are kind of taking their own sweet time and bottoming out. Let's put the moving averages in. You can see they did bow tie back up, but then they kind of turn back down again um but until we get stopped out i'm not going to get too excited about that for the most part though most areas look pretty good and like the point the gentleman was making earlier it's like well why would we be at something like energies when retail looks like this and he actually pointed out the semis looks like this okay well it's because we're trying to catch an emerging trend pattern it's two different things we're doing okay we're trying to catch resumption of trends hopefully soon in retail and civvies and, and all of these other areas that are trending nicely. And we're also trying to catch some new trends as they emerge. So we do a little bit of both. Uh, we're not going for diversification, but it, it gives us a little diversification, easy for me to, to say, in the process. A couple days ago, these go-go -go stocks got hit fairly hard. We got hit in the biotech stocks and the portfolio got hit fairly hard. But oil had a big day and the oil stock had a big day so when you add them all together it's like ah, well we survived another day in the markets every day you survive is a good day that's the way I see it because trust me you've had some pretty bad days and I've had some pretty bad days and you know let's not go there right now um, the only thing that's really has me concerned about the markets is that the bonds continue to slide in here. Look at the TLT. We're making a new low in here. I don't know when it, it's uh, – we're March 5th. Anyone knows the last trading day for – if somebody knows the last trading day for March bonds, uh, let me know. I want to say it's the 15th, but I could be wrong on that. There's going to be a problem when we roll from March to June, and the reason is – that the government stopped issuing 30-year bonds for a while, okay, and then they started again. Now, that's a, we could get into a lengthy conversation about that, but that's a time for some other time. And, and you know, like my dentist said, he said, uh, he was telling me something about teeth, and he goes, oh, we have a beer one night, we could talk about that. But trust me, if we're having a beer, we'll probably be talking about other things. <laughs> anyway. But the point is the government stopped issuing bonds and they started again. And in the roll from March to June, they're going to compensate from those things. So the bond's going to effectively do, I think it's like a three for two split, which is kind of a weird kind of thing to wrap your heads around, wrap your head, wrap your heads around, wrap your head around. Um, my concern is that anytime you have something like this happen, it seems that it could have a ripple effect through the system. Somebody that's highly leveraged, gets it, it kind of creates an aberration in the market, and things kind of blow up. You get that so-called black swan shows up or whatever. So that's got me a little bit concerned. But you know what? There's always something to worry about. So I'm not going to get too excited about that. Okay, It was February 22nd. Okay, so the role has has begun to um, unwind. Okay, you sure that's the last trading day? That seems kind of strange. I, I should know this. Yeah, last trading day, yeah, March 20th. That sounds better. Yeah, I was a CTA for 15 years or 14 years, however long. Um, you think I know these things. But, yeah, that sounds that sounds more plausible. Yeah, it's it, the bond, certain certain contracts rule, uh, roll the month before. Yeah, so it's uh, March 20th. So over the next couple of weeks, we could start seeing some unwinding here. So, again, there's always something to worry about. But bonds down, what does that mean? Rates up, obviously. Yeah, first notice is 27. Okay, that's that's plausible. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at some of these interest-sensitive rate areas. So, obviously, real estate has gotten whacked in here, or as you would think. This is one case where logic actually – does apply, and in a market, uh, technical analysis usually plays out fairly well. If I could find it, talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. 
Uh, so far, you can see we kind of rolled over in the REITs. And then if you take a look at the bow ties there, I think they're eh, kind of sloppy, but you can see they're crossing over here. So REITs look like they're in trouble. The utilities really look like they're in trouble here. You got the bow tie coming off of all-time highs and so forth. They've, they've begun to slide out of that pattern. I haven't been going crazy shorting these uh, because I think that because they're lower in volatility, I think you're just as well shorting the efficient market of bonds, even though it is efficient. I think you're better off just shorting bonds for that play. Okay. Rates up, UUP up, UUP. Yeah, that's a dollar. Um, oops. Look at these guys down here. Hey, Obama, blah, blah, blah. It's like, stop talking. <laughs> Just trade. You're going to make yourself nuts. Yeah. Yeah, so the dollar is headed higher. There's a bubble in a dollar right now, obviously. Roll already 174 versus 5K volume. Okay, so Phil seems to, th seems to say uh, think that they roll based on the volume. And you're probably right on that. I don't look at all this stuff anymore. I just kind of look at the charts of it all. Do I like oil? Uh, yeah, I like oil. I like uh, USO2. Um, all right, let's go ahead. Uh, any other questions about the sectors or, or whatever? I th for the most part, things are looking pretty good. Let's just take a look at the Rusty real quick. Rusty's just kind of like the peas. It's broken out. It's come back. It's kind of tested the top of the range a little bit. Now it's headed back higher. Uh, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll see new highs sooner rather than later. As long as the market is making new highs, then you need to err on the side of the market. Err on the side of the trend. Don't fight the trend. Don't swim against the tide, okay? And if you do have some system that's calling a top, wait until you have some, some more signals. Or wait until that trend actually turns. Remember, as a trend follower, you're going to be a little late to the party, okay? Okay, so, uh, yeah, I still like oil, but oil like uh, or USO is what uh, is a proxy here for this. Same, same, same chart. Um, we liked it a, back, a while back because it didn't thrust off of lows and it did this little first thrust, okay? And it kind of looked like it was off to the races. Now it's come back in, but now we have, as you saw in the portfolio, we're underwater here, but so what, okay? We're going to play it out, we'll let it play out, and we're going to see what happens. Okay, let's go ahead and, and uh, uh, let's get to some of these stock questions. ARR for Thomas. He's been waiting patiently. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, no. Um, first of all, it's a REIT, okay? We just got through looking at the REITs. Second, you have a big blue arrow down. Well, Dave, did it rally off its lows? Well, not enough to get excited about, okay? And then it's just kind of rallied up. It's got a little bit of resistance here. So this is nothing to get too excited about yet. If you if you were hell bent on trading this stock, then maybe put a bow tie in and wait for these bow ties to come together and cross. Okay, but wait for time. Okay, where was the entry on sand? I don't remember. Um, I could give you could um, probably right here on this day here. Okay. It might have been a little earlier. It might have been here. But um, I'll give you the day it was recommended. Well, yeah, it's in the portfolio. Uh, if you could shoot me an email, I'll, I'll, put you a, uh, I'll give you a trial of the service, and you could go in and you could download um, all those, or you could watch all those archives and see what it was, uh, see what I saw at the time. And that's a, that's a good exercise, by the way, too, is going through those archives. Okay, the roll is usually a Thursday one week before the latest. Some retail brokers like mine allow uh, close after that. Yeah, so you got to start. So that all that's beginning to unwind, and hopefully uh, it, it won't cause a ripple through the system. But there's always something to worry about. U.S. bond and equity index option futures always expire the same day. Okay. Is that why they call it a triple witching or something? Options, um, futures, and something else. Okay, Nate wants to know about PFNX. I think that's what I like. Um, yeah, the only thing that has me a little concerned is it did run up about 100%. This, I like it because it's in my momentum list. Um, 
it did run up about a hundred percent over a short period of time so that's my only concern so um, I would be careful but yeah on a pullback maybe it hasn't really pulled back enough given the magnitude of its run higher in here so I'd probably pass FLWS yeah that's another momentum one um, it's not set up though okay so you, oh it is set up let me take that back as of today it's set up now the only thing that's gotten a little scary in here is like that other one we just looked at, um, Nate, it, it has gone up about 100%. But, yeah, it's a TKO. Uh, it's almost like I prefer a tiny bit more of a knockout, okay? But, yeah, I think this one's plausible, and you would enter above today's high and stop below today's low and trade it like a textbook TKO. Uh, I think that's certainly plausible. I probably personally will go after it. Uh, this 100% this run's got me a little leery. And based on a 100% run, I'd prefer if it would have had a little bit more knockout, maybe down below 11, okay? But it's definitely a plausible setup. It's definitely a TKO. It's definitely a good-looking stock. You definitely have persistency. I sound like Rain Man, definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, so I can't argue with it, okay? But a lot of times, as you know, I sort of look for perfection. It may be to a fault sometimes. Serve, yeah, serve looks good, but it's going to have to uh, – you got a little bit of acceleration of trend here. You can need a little knockout move. The volatility is a little low in that one, though. That's the only thing I'm really not uh, crazy about. Long Cisco, I'm probably not going to like it. Cisco is a big, fat, um, mostly efficient type of stock. You can see, what does it do most of the time? It just chops around, okay? Bam, 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 bam. You know, it's like electrocardiogram so you're you're on an upswing it, it's I guess every time it has earnings it, it, it does something uh, this is not my type of stock to trade it has no structure that I can really work around for the most part so uh, you're on your own on that one F E Y E but personally I would not trade that uh, this is kind of interesting this has caught my eye it's kind of has a bit of that Phoenix characteristic to it um, I like it. I like the way that it broke out. It's kind of pulling back a little bit in here. My only problem, and again, I hate to pick apart things too much, is notice that the amount of days of this breakout in here, uh, or the sideways movement, I should say. When something breaks out from low levels, it should break out, pull back briefly, and not look back, and then take off again, okay? So I hear you. I think a major bottom is in place. I think this is a bit of, like I said, a Phoenix type of situation, where it could possibly go back to 90 bucks a share, it's all highs. Um, but I would personally pass just in the recent sideways action. But I hear you; it, it's not, it's not bad looking. It, and it probably, if it's not already on my minimalist, it'll probably find my way there. Heather wants to know about MFLX. MFLX. Uh, well, again, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a 100 percent move straight up over a short period of time. It's one of those cases where you could have too much of a good thing. You got bad memories back here. It's also too thin, okay? So uh, just because we're on a bit of a time crunch, I won't pick it apart any further, but that's enough right there to uh, eliminate it. Uh, OCUL. Uh, yeah, that looks good. That's a buy. This look right here. This is what, okay, this is a great example. Um, she's going to look, Heather's going to look like a shill. Um, this is one of the stocks that actually triggered right here from the um, from the IPO course okay and so far so good it's uh, pretty much tripled this is a rare uh, or a rare case where one we covered the fly the die we covered the fly we covered the die you know but the fly and fly this is one case where it flies and flies and keeps on going and you had a very beautiful um, double top knockout here but Dave why did we take it well I think it was on the Landry list on this day the reason we didn't take it was because we already had a boatload of biotechs in the portfolio okay and besides it already triggered from way back here anyway uh, Juno long Juno you know okay well it's not a setup so why would you be long do you know uh, I mean I hear you maybe it's a little bit of a breakout my scaling's messed up if I could fix the scaling on this chart uh, but yeah as I said sometimes you could play breakouts at IPOs but 
I don't see it. DMA? Uh, looks a little wide loose. Uh, it kind of shot up in here. I mean, it's okay. Uh, it's a bank. For the most part, it's kind of wide loose. It's pretty thin, too. It looks okay, but as you can see, it's kind of all over the place longer term, and it's a bank. It's a foreign bank, so it's got a couple of strikes against it. Uh, NBIX. NBIX. Yeah, this is on my momentum list. Um, this is an old friend of ours. We actually shorted it years back. Um, believe it or not, one thing that kind of jumps out at me, it looks like it's actually kind of lost momentum. It sort of went straight up in here. And now it's kind of drifting this way. Uh, maybe on a pullback. Uh, I'll know it when I see it. But, yeah, it's on a momentum list now. You're welcome, Thomas. Tan, uh, Dan, just uh, one, one at a time. So I'm, we'll take a look at Tan and then uh, put the other ones um, on one line, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, these, um, these solars are beginning to take off. Again, in here, I'll be looking at some lower-tiered ones that are beginning to take off. Uh, but until they pull back, it's not uh, set up. I think he also want to know about CSIQ. Um, CSIQ, it looks like it's kind of bottomed out in here, but it's kind of all over the place, and, and it's it's coming off of a mid-level. These uh, solar stocks, are, or just any stock, I like it when they're coming off of major, major lows. When you're, I'm sorry, a transitional pattern, when you trade these transitional patterns. Okay, WLK. But, yeah, it's not set up yet. Uh, yeah, this is another one that's coming off of mid-levels. It's kind of bottomed out at mid-levels. Uh, I mean, it's okay, but I prefer to trade a, a transitional pattern off of, like, like all-time highs back here. This was one, and I'm, I'd be willing to bet. I wouldn't bet my life, but I'd be willing to bet good money that this was actually a, a stock in the Landry list because it's coming off of all-time highs here. So that's when you want to pay, play a transition, not necessarily off of mid-levels. Now, let me interview myself. Can they work? Yes. I've seen a lot of bloggers out there talk about uh, playing these bow ties, but they, they don't realize that they're supposed to be playing them off of major, major, major lows. I mean, I suppose it's a one-year low, so that's better than the poke of the eye. And it does look like it's temporarily bottom, but um, I would pass on that. You're welcome, Heather. Interesting. Since 5,000 level 50 years ago, BK... BTK up almost 900%, while XLK, SpiderTech down 7%. Well, let's not read too much into that. All of these um, all of these sectors and ETFs and all, they look nothing like they looked back here. You know, it would be fun, it would be fun if you could do it. Go back in and find out on this reversal bar here. What stocks were in the XLK and what stocks are in there now? I bet you probably got like Intel, Microsoft, Oracle, and a couple other stocks like that that are still in there. And then 99% of the rest of them uh, are no longer in there. So I, I wouldn't get too excited about that. You know, even the S&P uh, 500, um, people think, oh, I'm just going to buy an index fund. Well, that index has like a ridiculous turnover, believe it or not. Okay, so everything is always a little bit more complicated than it seems. First solar for Thomas. Oops. There it is. That was a weekly, a monthly. Um, you know, it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. These solars are going to have to make some uh, fairly serious highs. For me to get excited, this stock would have to get above 75. So it's just kind of wide and loose. I mean, I know they're they're currently bottom. Craig wants to take a look at Keys, K E Y S. Um, yeah, this was one that this was actually on our list. This actually triggered right here, um, in the uh, as as an IPO breakout, I think, uh, if memory serves. And so far, so good on uh, on that one. Well, potential turnarounds or challenge of trend, how much, what percentage move above any stocks given lows catch your eye? Well, it all depends on the volatility of the stock. So like in the case of USO, uh, what caught my eye at USO is that, let's just measure this and see. Uh, this was only a 18% move. Well, only, 
That's still a sizable move. But if you take a look at some of these biotech stocks we trade, they might move 10, 15 percent in one day. Okay, so that's not a significant move. But for uh, a commodity like oil, 20 percent round numbers is a pretty big move. Steve wants to know about EPAM. Uh, yeah, looks good. Um, it needs a little bit more of a pullback, but I certainly can't fault you on that one. A little wide and loose longer term, but shorter term, it has broken out. Yeah, it needs a little bit more pullback. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely can't argue with that at all. LinkedIn, Alan KD. I forgot who asked, so uh, whoever did. Uh, well, it's broken out. It's a big gap here, so I would leave it alone. Um this one lately has kind of been trading in chunks, so it's kind of hard to trade, okay? Um, I mean, once you get long, if it trades in chunks, that's okay, but there's really no place to get on. Look, and, and, you know, this is kind of looking like uh, earnings and earnings and just kind of all over the place. Uh, very hard stock to trade based on the way it's acting. BPY for John. BPY. Uh, it looks okay, but it's sort of like... Yeah, I think I'd pass because it broke out, and then it came all the way back into where it broke out. Of, I think you can find better out there. I mean, especially like, you know, take a look at like the semis, SMH. Oops. You got something like the semis. Well, eh, not that great, but semis have like broken out in here. Maybe I'm thinking of like retail and some of these other areas, biotech, retail. Um, so you you could look for more perfection now. UVV for John. Uh, no, I don't like this drift higher in here. And then you've got tons and tons and tons of overhead resistance, okay? CBI, a buy, bow tie cross, now consolidating gap move. Thanks, Richard. Okay, all right, Richard, let's take a look at that. CBI, CBI. Yeah, yeah, uh, looks like we've got a little uh, overhead supply uh, marked in from last week. But, uh, no, I hear you, Richard, good eye. Um you know, you might even get a high five on this one. Uh, look at that bow tie coming off of all-time lows. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a perfect, perfect setup, but it's a pretty good-looking setup. Let's see. Yeah, we're not all-time lows, but we're like, uh, let's see, five-year lows or so at least. So that's a pretty good-looking setup. That's what a turn should look like, okay, what a market turns. It's hit the major low. It's rallied off the major low. Uh, it's made a bow tie. It's pulled back. So, yeah, that looks pretty good. It's probably uh, one of the better looking ones today. So, congratulations. High five. Let's give you a high five. Uh, Andre, MTSN. Andre is in. Are you in Russia, Andre? SN, I forget where you are. Too many people to keep up with. <clears throat> yeah, this looks pretty good, too. I don't know who asked me about it. Um, a little bit needs a little bit more knockout. Maybe like to like 425 or so. But yeah, definitely keep that on your on your radar. All right, I can't cover that one. That's that's the stock of the day in my trading service, so we can't cover that one. But Art, right, you get a high five. I, I like it a lot. Okay, uh, next week bring it up again. If it triggers, we'll uh, we'll certainly cover it. Uh, no, I'm not sure who asked about this one, so I can't beat you up. But uh, no, uh, it's just kind of run up. It's kind of lost some a bit of. It's kind of all over the place. I don't see it. Um, two other tray. Heather says, no HV is important. Part of your stock selection, do you use factor and relative strength? Um, no, I don't really factor in relative strength. I mean, I do keep a momentum list based on they have to – a stock has to make a new high to make my momentum list, okay? And then I keep an eye on those. So, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on relative strength, but it's not like I'm, I'm running a relative strength scan and only picking the stocks that have certain relative strength or whatever. Because the way I do things, like I said earlier, there's three phases of trend. Trend transition or, or emerging trends, and then you have accelerating trends and trend resumption. So um, I, I suppose if I wanted to, I could I could look at like a delta relative strength, which would be a one. You know, I mean, that's fodder for research. If that's something you want to do, delta relative strength I think would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, I've threatened for years to, to do research there. But you know what? I always just come back to looking at charts. And that's that has served me well, and I, it's kind of like I don't want to ruin my mojo by quantifying by quantifying some of these things like that. But it, it, it's like I think if I had a um, 
a research staff. I think, um, and, and and I was in a business where we were uh, putting out research and and just stuff that people people love that kind of stuff. Um, anything that you can kind of quantify, people just eat it alive. And I'd probably make a lot more money if I did it as opposed to just doing what my passion about is looking at the charts. But I think you could probably quantify something with delta relative strength, meaning the change in relative strength. Is it? It's kind of like the temperature. Okay, it's like. Um, if I tell you it's it's uh, 40 degrees outside, you're like, yeah, that's kind of cool. But if I tell you that, well, five minutes ago or 20 minutes ago, it was 60 degrees. And it's kind of like what happened to us here in Louisiana. I made, friends of all my, I made fun of all my friends up north um, for freezing their butts off while I was down here in a pair of shorts riding my bike around the neighborhood. And... Um, Today, it's like karma caught up with me. It's, it's freezing cold outside. So yesterday, it was 75 degrees, and then today, it's about 40 and blowing about 30 miles an hour. So the delta in the, in the change is, is very important. So such a severe drop is more important than the relative um, strength in and of itself, okay? So just because it's it's... 40 degrees, it doesn't really mean anything, but if it's dropping significantly, then that means something, or vice versa if it's warming up, okay? So is the stock warming up or cooling off? That's what you need to ask yourself. And then as Einstein said, you also need to ask yourself, is it universe friendly, right? This looks fantastic. This is on, if this isn't on my momentum list. It should be, uh, oh, well, it's because it's just as of today. So tonight I will put this. This is how a stock makes my momentum list. Doesn't mean I want to rush out and trade it. Let's just see if it's already on there. This is beautiful. Unfortunately, it's not set up. Okay, so it broke out. Uh, MDVN. No, it's not on my list. But I guarantee you uh, there's a 99% chance that I will put the stock on this list tonight. Okay? Because my only criteria is that ideally it has to make a new high on an expansion of range. So on a pullback, I think it might be worthwhile. Thank you, Nate. Nate says, good show. I appreciate that, Nate. Uh, yeah, Phil, keep an eye on that, buddy. Uh, I think you're onto something. NCR, no, it's all over the place. It's too thick. It's not something that I like to trade. It's just kind of electrocardiogram. So I think you can find something better. Another form. <laughs> Harley says, Dave, another fun and informing webinar. A little winky smiley face. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. No NCR. I don't like NCR. Oh, I NCR. Oh, okay. Boy, it's getting, my eyes are getting shitty. <laughs> it's getting hard to read. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's a reverend asking that question. Sorry, reverend. <laughs> Uh, well, it broke out, but then it, it's it's um, it looks like it's kind of come back to where it's broken out from. It's okay. Um, you'd have been better off trading it, uh, maybe. Well, I'm not really seeing much in here to trade. It is a new issue. I hear you. You can be a little bit more lenient. I, I'll give it a possibility because something that's a little bit newer issue, I, I tend to be a little bit more lenient, so I'll give you an okay on that. Uh, Steve wants to know about ICLR. Um, uh, let's see. No, I don't like just this one big up bar in here um, in the trend. I think I would pass on that. I'd like to see several bars. I mean, you could argue that, well, it kind of took off in here, but no, it's just kind of one extreme bar. Okay. Eyes. That one I like. Um, I like in that it, uh, it bottomed out in here. It's like it's kind of a micro phoenix. I, I talk about the phoenix strategy. Um, I like that it bottomed out as an IPO, and then I like the little breakout here a few weeks back. This is this is when this one had caught my eye, uh, right when it broke out from this low level range. I'm not a big fan of breakouts, but they can work in IPOs, as we discussed in the um, in the course. But now you would have to wait for a pullback on this particular stock before trading again. All right, let's wipe out a couple more, and then we have to uh, have to wrap things up. Uh, software is only uh, good for about an hour and a half. At least that's my experience with it. Uh, plus, I'm only good for about an hour and a half. <laughs> then I need a break. Um, 
Yeah, it's a utility. Utilities aren't doing so well. I'm not sure I would go after this one based on that, but it's just kind of, it's got a couple of big, um, it's hard to explain. Just You just have a couple of big updates, really only one big update in this trend. Uh, I think I would pass on that one. And then it's got to pull back. So maybe if it pulled back, I'd reconsider. But for the most part, it's wide and loose. Okay, GTLS for Howard. GT, GTLS. Let's go to you, Greg, because I don't think we uh, got to you all day. Next. Greg, you're next. Um, no, it's got too much overhead resistance coming in on that one. GTLS. No, you got too much overhead resistance. What did Greg want to know about? SMCI. Did we cover that one? Uh, a little too wide and loose. I mean, it just kind of, um, you know, it goes up. Well, here's the thing. Since we don't have a whole lot of time, never forget about net-net price change. So net-net, um, it really hasn't made much forward progress since uh, since January. Okay, so just that's the short answer on that is no. Well, look, I know we've got a lot more stacked up in here. We just kind of ran out of time. I'm, I guess I pontificated a little too much. But uh, let me go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, taking time out of your business schedule to be here. As you can tell, I love doing these shows. As I said earlier, I learn a lot in the process, too. So from a selfish standpoint, um, that's one reason why I do them. Uh, anyway, everybody have a fantastic night. Any uh, questions, uh, as usual, daviddavelander.com. And I'll either answer you directly or if it's a little bit more advanced or um, involved answer, We'll, uh, we'll cover it next week. It'll be fodder for next week's show. Anyway, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And then uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again uh, next week. You're welcome, Leon. Thank you so much.